Hi everybody and welcome back to the channel to be like Christ. In today's video, we're going to talk about what happens when you don't have God as your highest treasure. The text that I want to talk about today is actually in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And to give you a little bit of context, in 2 Samuel 7, David is just kind of coming on the scene and he's becoming prominent and God is blessing him tremendously. And David starts to think in his mind, well, maybe I should give something back to God. And that's where our text brings us. The text says, Now when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. So David starts to look around and he realizes, wow, I'm really blessed and God has been really good to me. And so maybe I should give him something back. But take a look at verse 4. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the days I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now on the surface, David's idea sounds pretty good, right? I mean, that sounds like a holy thing to do, build God a house. But God actually has a different opinion, and that is that he's not really that interested in David building him a house. But God continues in verse 8, listen to what he says. Now therefore, thus thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be a prince over my people Israel. And then jump down to verse 11. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all of your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. Verse 16, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. One thing that's really interesting about this text is that God flips the table on David. David comes to God and he says, I'm going to make you a house. And God comes to David and he says, no, 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 no. I got bigger things in mind. I've got a sovereign plan that I formed since the foundations of the world in mind, and I'm going to make you a house. David had in mind the glory of the physical, but God had in mind the glory of the spiritual. Now what I want you to do is to take this story and bring your mind over into the New Testament. By the time we get to the New Testament, there is a temple built. It's built by David's son, Solomon. And one day, Jesus is standing before the temple with his apostles. And you remember what he says? He says, tear this temple down, and in three days, I'll build it back up. And you remember how the Pharisees reacted? They were, oh, you know, oh, they were just disgusted that Jesus would say something like this. They said, this temple's been in building for 46 years, and and you say you can build it in three days. They even bring this up at his trial later on before his crucifixion. And let me ask you, what was the Pharisees' problem? I think their problem is that they failed to grasp what God was trying to teach David way back in 2 Samuel. The Pharisees should have been thinking more spiritually, less physically. They had a problem with seeing the glory of the physical, the glory of the things around them, even the glory of the things of God, but not the glory of God himself. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, man, they loved the temple. It was their treasure. It was their national symbol of pretty much everything that it meant to be a Jew. But it was their treasuring of the temple that blinded them to the true treasure that God was trying to show them. And the huge failure of the Pharisees and the Sadducees is that they didn't learn the lesson of 2 Samuel chapter 7. They had these scriptures. They knew the history, and yet they failed to apply them. They love the things of God. Even even the idea of of being religious, they were all about that. They loved this magnificent temple. The problem was that they failed to love the God whom it was built for. They loved the temple because they thought it was the house of God. But the only problem was that the house of God was actually standing outside that day, saying that he was going to tear it down and rebuild it in three days. The house of David 
The house that God promised to build was outside on the street and they couldn't see it because they were blinded by their love for the things of God and not God himself. And that blindness prevented them from aligning their lives in a way that they could be a part of God's eternal plan. Because of their blindness, they couldn't correctly apply or appreciate or study God's word. They couldn't understand his promises and how they were ultimately going to be fulfilled. They got stuck in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 2, and they couldn't see far enough to 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 11. And you may ask, well, what does that have to do with me? Because there is no old law, new law transition anymore. We're already past that. And, you know, there is no temple anymore. So, okay, give me some application. I think there is a lesson here for 21st century Christians. And that is that we have to love God and make God our treasure and God our joy. Not just the things of God. And I don't think it's very hard to fall into the trap of the Pharisees, loving this idea of religion. Loving maybe even the blessings that represent God or that come from God, but not necessarily God himself. What is it that makes you do religious things? Is it your friends? Your youth group? Is that why you go? Because you enjoy spending time with them and getting to know them better and going out to eat with them after Bible study or worship on a Sunday or Wednesday? Maybe it's just your church family as a whole. You love the people that are there. They're so nice to you. You give gifts to each other, and that's what brings you back time and time again to the church. Maybe it's a great speaker. You love to hear a person speak the word of God. Every Sunday they bring a message. Things are brought out of the text that you've never even seen before, and that's why you go. Maybe it's activities. Maybe your church has great activities. You know, a couple times a year they have great youth rallies or, or uh, they take trips together or they go see the, the ark in Kentucky. <laughs> Maybe it's because your family goes there and you know if you don't show up, they're not going to be too happy. Maybe it's because you love preparing Bible classes and presenting them. Maybe it's because you love preaching sermons and developing your skill set as a public speaker. Maybe you go because you know that the singing that particular day is going to be really great. Maybe your life falls on hard times and you think maybe the church can make it a little bit better. These things aren't bad things. But the problem that we run into is that if these are the sole reasons why we go to worship or go to Bible study or gather with the church, then we're stuck in a 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 2 mindset. That we're in love with the things of God, but we're not in love with God himself. And unless God is our greatest treasure... Unless God himself is the source of all of our love, unless God is the source of all of our joy, then we're going to end up in the same spot where the Pharisees were. And that's a place where we can never fully come to appreciate the promises of God. We can never understand fully why we're here, why we are created. And we're never going to be able to align ourselves with his sovereign, eternal purpose. We will blind ourselves to the true purpose for why we are here and why we do all these religious things anyway. The Bible tells us that where our treasure is, there will our heart be also. And if our heart is only with the things of God, then ultimately we'll be using all of those things just for our own ends. But if our heart is with God himself and he is our treasure, then all of these other good blessings will fall into place and we'll be able to see them in the proper perspective, a God-centered worldview that is God-glorifying and God-directed. Hi everybody and thanks for watching this channel. On this channel, this is what we're about, becoming more like Jesus to live a God-glorifying life. And if you haven't subscribed already, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, share the video, comment down below. I appreciate your time. See you next time.